during my final year in high school. Subscribe if you I had like a friend scary named stories. Alex. Story the majority one. of the details in this story have been provided by him. Alex was enrolled in advanced classes designed to prepare students for college, including subjects like English, science, and difficult mathematics. He had a teacher named Mr. Thompson, who taught chemistry to the brightest students in the school. Mr. Thompson was a man in his mid-40s, standing at about 5 foot 10 inches and carrying a bit of extra weight. He wasn't a cruel person, but he didn't possess a lot of charisma either. In truth, he was quite dull, speaking in a monotone voice with a blank expression on his face. Mr. Thompson's lessons lacked structure. He would simply assign a chapter from the textbook and then spend his time at his desk, perhaps reading a newspaper or engaging in some other activity. It seemed as if he had lost his passion for teaching, assuming he ever had it in the first place. As a result, the students in his class exploited the situation by chatting and goofing off. You might assume that the most intelligent students in the school would use their time more productively, but that wasn't the case. These students were just as eager to take advantage of the circumstances as anyone else. There were paper airplanes soaring through the air, lots of conversations, and an overall lack of respect for Mr. Thompson's authority. The worst of the bunch was a student named Dylan, the typical class clown who used this class as an opportunity to entertain others. Dylan was quite intelligent and generally a nice person. But at 16, he was more than happy to capitalize on the lack of supervision. Ultimately, the responsibility of managing the class falls on the teacher, so there's enough blame to share. Alex and his classmates grew accustomed to this environment, treating this class as a time to unwind and decompress. They referred to it as recess, a period for games and socializing reminiscent of their elementary school days. However, one day everything changed, and things spiraled out of control. No one understood why at the time, but Mr. Thompson had transformed. His previously bored expression was replaced with a furious glare, and his normally pink face had turned a deep shade of red. His eyes were red and bloodshot as he stood at the front of the classroom mumbling, Read chapter 7 and complete problems 1 through 9. After that, he returned to his desk and sat down. The class barely took notice and resumed their usual activities, none of which involved chemistry work. Everyone was conversing and sharing jokes loudly. This continued for some time until Mr. Thompson suddenly muttered, Quiet down. Get back to work. A brief moment of silence followed as the students were likely surprised by his attempt to assert authority in the class. At that moment, Dylan stood up and impersonated Mr. Thompson. He stuffed his backpack under his shirt to mimic the teacher's physique and stood there taunting him. Quiet down, everyone! Dylan jeered, waving his arm and laughing. Mr. Thompson approached Dylan as the class roared with laughter. Dylan, sit down, he whispered. However, Dylan remained standing, laughing, and making ridiculous faces meant to ridicule Mr. Thompson. The teacher's face grew red with anger as his student continued to disrespect him. Suddenly, Mr. Thompson drew back his arm and punched Dylan squarely in the nose. Dylan fell to the floor, more stunned than injured. Mr. Thompson stood there, his entire body trembling and tears streaming down his face. The entire class stared in disbelief. Dylan sat up briefly before falling back down, perhaps thinking it best to stay down. Unsurprisingly, Mr. Thompson wasn't at school the following day, or even the next week. Rumors circulated in the wake of the incident. While the truth remains uncertain, the prevailing theory was that Mr. Thompson's wife had left him that very morning, taking their children with her. He found himself alone in an empty house, and with nothing else to do, went to work as usual. The combined stress of his personal life in the chaotic classroom caused him to snap. It's crucial to remember that we can never fully understand what someone else may be going through beneath the surface. While this doesn't excuse Mr. Thompson's actions, it highlights the importance of treating others with respect. We can never be sure who just lost their job, faced eviction, or experienced the loss of a loved one. Everyone has a breaking point. And on that day, Mr. Thompson reached his. We never saw or heard from him again, but I hope he received the help he needed. Story number two. During my time in elementary school, we had an annual field trip that occurred in the final month of each academic year. This trip served as a celebration and acknowledgement of the students' dedication and effort throughout the year. We eagerly anticipated this event and would excitedly try to guess the destination as it changed every year. On one particular occasion, we had two potential destinations, a musical theater production of The Lion King 
inspired by the popular film released around the same time, or a visit to the Six Flags Great America Amusement Park, located a couple of hours away from our school. Naturally, as a group of 8th graders, we had a clear preference. However, our teachers had the final say, and ultimately chose the theater option. Consequently, we found ourselves heading to downtown Chicago, where the theater was located. Our school arranged a chartered bus for transportation, and early in the morning, we embarked on the approximately two-hour journey. Although I felt a sense of disappointment at missing out on a day filled with roller coasters, I couldn't deny the excitement of venturing into the big city with all my friends as the school year drew to a close. The familiar suburban landscape transformed into towering skyscrapers and bustling crowds. I had been to the city a handful of times with my parents and was always left in awe of its sheer magnitude. Upon arriving at the theater, we settled in to watch the performance. Admittedly, I was somewhat skeptical at first. However, I must concede that the show was nothing short of spectacular. In fact, I attribute my love for musical theater today to the lasting impression that this show had on me. Once the show concluded, my classmates and I began to exit the theater. With about 20 students per teacher, maintaining order proved to be quite challenging, especially in such a bustling environment. I attempted to maintain visual contact with my teacher, but soon found myself utterly disoriented. Keep in mind, I was in 8th grade and barely 5 feet tall, so navigating through the crowd was no easy feat. When I finally reached the street, I expected to find my teacher and classmates waiting for me, but I recognized no one. I stood there for several minutes, looking like a distraught child, tears streaming down my face. I was convinced they had left without me. A few minutes later, an elderly man, likely around 55 or 60 years old, approached me. Hi there, I'm a friend of your mom's. She told me to come and get you, he claimed. I couldn't understand how my mom knew I was lost, and the situation puzzled me. However, feeling increasingly desperate, I reluctantly agreed to follow him. He led me to his vehicle, which was a white van with tinted windows. Get in the back, I'll take you to your mom, he instructed. Uneasiness washed over me, and I began to regret my decision to trust this stranger. Despite my fear, I hesitated to speak up, worried that I might anger him. I stood there, frozen for about 30 seconds, unsure of what to do next. Come on, kid. She's waiting, he urged. As I turned around, I caught sight of my teacher sprinting towards us, panic etched across her face. When I glanced back at the van, it had vanished. The man had driven away. As it turned out, my teacher and classmates had just emerged from the theater. Somehow, I had managed to get ahead of them, and my teacher was diligently ensuring that everyone made it out safely. I shudder to think about the stranger's true intentions. That harrowing experience remains the most terrifying of my life. Although it ended safely, it shook me to my core. My parents had taught me the usual precautions for dealing with strangers, but applying those lessons in real-life situations proved to be an entirely different challenge. Story number three. During my high school years, there was a custodian who made me feel uneasy. His name was Mr. Carter, and he was a tall, slender man with lengthy, graying hair. His uniform was always torn and shabby, and I'm quite certain he never bothered to clean it. The odor that emanated from him was something unfamiliar to me back then. But as I've grown older, I now recognize it as the smell of alcohol. He wasn't necessarily a cruel person. He never displayed any signs of anger or a short temper. Instead, he kept to himself, which in some ways made him seem even more frightening as though he was suppressing something within him, something that could erupt at any time. At least, that's the impression I had. My school was fairly small, with a population of only around 200 students. It was situated in a peaceful neighborhood, with a parking area for teachers and other staff members at the front, and a public park at the back. My friends and I would occasionally sneak off to the public park during recess to enjoy a little more freedom away from school premises. Technically, we were not permitted to leave school grounds during the day, and if a teacher caught us, they would usually make us return. However, one day, Mr. Carter spotted us in the park. He gazed at us through the chain-link fence, not uttering a single word. It's difficult to describe, but the way he looked at us sent shivers down our spines. He stood there for a good 10 to 15 minutes, just staring intently at us. When we finally returned from recess, I encountered him in the hallway. Once again, he didn't say anything just stared at me. It may not seem like much, 
but I can assure you it was extremely disconcerting. Another aspect worth mentioning about Mr. Carter was his apparent dislike for our principal, Mrs. Thompson. Mrs. Thompson was, in many ways, the polar opposite of Mr. Carter. Mrs. Johnson, our principal, was known for her strict management style and had no qualms about expressing criticism. She was around 50 years old, with her hair neatly arranged in a professional bun and always dressed in a crisp suit paired with high-heeled shoes. She was the kind of person who took pleasure in enforcing rules and ensuring people adhered to them. Her approach could be perceived as harsh or even downright heartless. Although she may have believed that her high expectations were beneficial to us, my friends and I didn't see it that way. Most students feared her, and she would patrol the playground during recess, as if searching for students misbehaving. Whenever she approached our group, everyone would tread carefully. Mrs. Johnson didn't treat the staff any differently, including Mr. Carter. To be fair, Mr. Carter provided plenty of reasons for her criticism, such as his disheveled appearance, the quality of his work, and his apparent alcohol consumption. It was no surprise that the two of them frequently clashed. They tried to keep their disagreements away from students, but occasionally, I would witness their arguments. One day, however, their conflict escalated significantly. I'm not sure what triggered it, but my friends and I observed them engaged in a heated shouting match in the school parking lot. Spectators gathered as they exchanged harsh words. As Mrs. Johnson yelled at him, Mr. Carter's face turned a deep shade of red. She pointed her finger directly in his face, shouting things I'd rather not recount. It was quite startling to see two adults, who were supposed to be role models, behaving in such a manner. We watched for several minutes until a teacher finally dispersed the crowd. I assumed that would be the end of it, but regrettably, I was mistaken. When I arrived at school the following morning, I was stunned to find the area swarming with police cars. One of the teachers stood on the street, informing me that the school was closed for the day and that I could go home. Although I was initially thrilled about the unexpected day off, I couldn't shake the feeling of concern. Later that evening, while watching the news with my parents, we all focused intently when my school's name was mentioned. As it turned out, Mr. Carter had brought a homemade bomb to the school and attempted to conceal it in one of the utility rooms. Fortunately, he was caught by another custodian who worked only a few days each week. Needless to say, we never saw Mr. Carter again. It was deeply unsettling to discover that he had been capable of such an act. In retrospect, the warning signs were present, but it's always easier to recognize them with the clarity of hindsight. I'm unsure how long he had been planning this, and the most frightening thought is what might have happened if the other custodian hadn't been there that day. It's possible that the altercation with Mrs. Johnson prompted Mr. Carter to act when he did. If not for their argument the previous day, he might have been more deliberate in his actions. As far as I know, that heated exchange may have saved numerous lives, including my own. However, we can never be certain. Story number four. In 2013, I found myself in the 10th grade, and there were two students in my class who stood out from the rest, Liam and Jake. They just didn't seem to fit in with the rest of us. I don't believe they experienced bullying, at least not that I ever witnessed. Our classmates and I even attempted to include them in various activities, both in school and during our free time, but they always came across as somewhat peculiar. I'm not exactly sure how else to describe them. One day, during a lesson, I noticed Liam cracking open a black pen in an attempt to paint his fingernails with the ink. Naturally, it turned into a disaster, with ink staining his hands and clothing. The teacher caught sight of this and promptly sent him to the principal's office to address his disruptive behavior. Jake, on the other hand, was an even more enigmatic character. He was extremely quiet, and I recall going through an entire semester without hearing him utter a single word. Despite their individual oddities, Liam and Jake somehow formed a strong bond and became inseparable friends. In fact, I don't think either of them had any other close friends at school. It wasn't unusual for one or both of them to be absent from school on any given day. Thus, it didn't initially raise any alarms when they stopped coming to school altogether. However, as more and more days passed without their return, a growing sense of unease and curiosity spread among the students. Conversations filled with speculation and various theories about their disappearance became commonplace. My friend Daniel suggested that Liam and Jake had been transferred to a specialized school designed to accommodate students with unique needs. 
Another widely circulated theory was that the principal had grown weary of dealing with their unusual behavior and had expelled them. In retrospect, I wish either of those theories had been accurate. Roughly a month after their disappearance, a shocking news report was broadcast on television one evening. It revealed that Jake's parents had discovered incriminating messages between their son and Liam on Facebook. The messages contained substantial evidence suggesting that the two boys were conspiring to carry out some form of attack on our school. The exact nature of their plan was never disclosed to us, as the news report refrained from delving into the details. I believe there were concerns about violating their privacy, since they were still minors at the time. Consequently, Liam and Jake were not subjected to legal action. Instead, they were sent to a mental health facility for evaluation and treatment, given their age and the fact that they hadn't actually executed their plan. The revelation of this chilling plot left my classmates and me deeply unsettled. It was a frightening realization that we had spent years sitting alongside these two individuals, completely unaware of the dark thoughts brewing in their minds. We all felt immense gratitude towards Jake's parents for recognizing the warning signs and taking the initiative to investigate further. Their actions may very well have averted a potentially devastating tragedy. In summary, the story of Liam and Jake serves as a sobering reminder of the importance of staying vigilant and attentive to the behavior of those around us. It also underscores the need for schools and communities to foster environments where everyone feels included and supported, in the hope of preventing such distressing incidents from occurring in the future.